I'm joined by actor, director, screenwriter, novelist, Ethan Hawke. Ethan, thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. You have programmed a very interesting uh, double feature. A couple of films from 1950. Uh, tell us what they are. All right. Well, we've got a gun theme here. We've got Gunfighter and Gun Crazy. I, I think I picked the two of them simply because of the joy of the double feature titles. Right. They, they came to my mind, and then I started realizing how well they fit together. First of all, they're two of my favorite movies, and I love showing older movies to people that maybe they haven't seen. They're not wildly famous movies, and they're both great. Yeah. Um, and they're both a lot of fun. Sometimes people tell you, oh, I want you to see this black and white 1950 movie, and it feels like they're giving you homework. <laughs> These movies are not homework. They're really a lot of fun, and they're brilliantly made, and they're substantive. And I think it's weird. Then there's, there's a definite thematic through line. There's definitely, the, the... yeah, they're both about people imprisoned by their weapon. Right. They think their weapon is to their advantage, and it ends up being in their way. We're starting with The Gunfighter from 1950, uh, starring uh, Gregory Peck. This you discovered as an adult, yeah? I did. I was a big Bob Dylan fan, am a big Bob Dylan fan, and a big Sam Shepard fan, and I found out, what is it? These two guys wrote a song together, and they wrote this song called Brownsville Girl, and I was, it's a very weird, very long song, and yeah, it's like 11. Now. Yeah, it's like 11 minutes long. It's on Knocked Out and Loaded. And I was listening to this song over and over again, and he has this line, and he goes, I saw this movie once, and it started Gregory Pick. And I started listening. I was like, what movie is Bob Dylan talking about? And he makes like, there's like three or four references back to the movie. Oh, and, and then it, the song yeah. ends with it, yeah, where he right. starts thinking about Gregory Peck again. Yeah. And, and, At one and point I, it says he'll see anything with Gregory Peck. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't care. I'll see anything with yeah. Gregory Peck in it. I don't mind. I'll stand in line. I'll I don't go. mind. Yeah. yeah. So I got kind of obsessed. What song are they, what movie are they writing about? And I called my friend Richard Linkletter. Long time collaborator. Long time collaborator of mine. And he's a brilliant man and really fun person. And he's also a crazy cinephile. I called him up and said, what movie is Bob Dylan talking about? And he said, you haven't seen The Gunfighter? <laughs> and I'm like, no, I haven't seen The Gunfighter. He's like, it's the best Western that isn't famous. Oh, that's a great line. It's a great line. It you might know, be true. Yeah, yeah, it's a totally defendable line. Yeah. yeah, and he was like, you know, the, he said to me, the first thing I would do if I was ever asked to teach cinema is I would teach the screenplay to Gunfighter. The movie is so well built, the way one domino hits another domino, and the level of naturalism for a 1950s movie. It's still yeah. got some whiff of corn to it, but it's the power of the screenplay. It's so razor sharp. Yeah, it's, and it's just a really simple premise. Peck comes to a town looking for the woman he used to love, and they've been separated, and he's a gunfighter, right? Great gunfighter, and he's killed a lot of guys, always were led to believe, and they drew first, right? But he wants to put those days behind him. But it's hard. Right? But actions yeah. have reactions. Yeah, that's and, right. Right. you know, it's like almost a, the movie could be called Karma. But, but he spends most of the movie, he's so commanding, even though he's definitely playing a Gregory Peck type. Right? You right. Know? There's a little um, Atticus in there. But he, he, uh, he's mostly, the 90% of the movie, he's sitting in a bar. That's the power of the movie is... He can't go out because everybody wants to pick a fight with him. I read somewhere that the author of the screenplay got the idea from having dinner with Jack Dempsey and everybody kept wanting to fight him. Oh, that's interesting. It totally makes sense. Everybody wanted to take a shot at the Everyone was like, hey, there he yeah. is. Let's pick a fight with him. And I, you know, I remember hearing that as a young kid. I was like, why does Sylvester Stallone have bodyguards? You're like, oh, because everybody wants to fight Rocky. No. And, and that brings us back to Bob Dylan because what I think he was writing about this movie is about when your celebrity becomes bigger than you are and you're, you're trapped by your celebrity as well. You're a prisoner of it. And so he's, the movie's using, you know, being a gunslinger as a metaphor of celebrity, prism of the ego, whatever yeah. you want to do with it. But I see why Dylan at that moment in his life when he's writing the song, that's when he was becoming... A prisoner and you got to be worried about the next every new musician wants to bring you down wow that's interesting stuff i like that i like that all right i tell you what let's uh take a look at the film we'll come back we'll talk about it afterwards uh here it is uh, directed by henry king henry king gregory peck leading the cast of the gunfighter i am back with the director actor screenwriter novelist ethan hawk ethan thanks for being here my pleasure 
Ethan uh, program, tonight's double feature. We just saw The Gunfighter, Gregory Peck, 1950. Uh, actor named Skip Holmeyer played poor Hunt Bromley. Poor Hunt he just Bromley. couldn't talk no sense to that kid. You couldn't, yeah. you, like a lot of kids, you yeah. know. What's funny is, I don't know if everybody, I want to make sure everybody who has watched the movie noticed, because depending on your TV or how it's going, my wife didn't notice that the final shot is Hunt Bromley. It's the same image as Gregory Peck, only now they've replaced each other. Like, I think what the director is telling you is that Hunt has become the new Jimmy Ringo, right, and right. he's haunted by his past, by this murder of Jimmy Ringo, as much as Jimmy was by the murders that he had. Yeah, but of course, what we know about Jimmy Ringo, or what we think we know about him, is, is that he never would have taken out somebody like that, even as a young man. We don't really know, right? Because he's, years have passed. I know, and that's where I think it's, it has a slight gloss of, of 50s hope, where it's like the real Jimmy Ringo. There's probably a couple of innocents. Yeah, when like, took that, you know, when that, that, the guy who's got the rifle pointed him from the window, who he, yeah. he says, you know, I didn't kill your son. It's right. like, is he sure? Right, is he sure? Right. Is he, does he really remember everybody? Are there yeah. some, were there some gunfights where you're not sure who the... Cl I like that that storyline ended the way it did. Like you're sort of left to believe that that, you know, that that guy, he disarms, he puts in, he locks him up, explains that he's never been to that town. Like you almost think that's the guy who's going to get out and still shoot him. And but still no, shoot him. No, that guy was in prison the rest of the movie. But that's what's yeah. brilliant about the yeah. movie is you actually don't know. You kind of, the back of your spider sense tells you Jimmy Ringo's doesn't have long to live. Right, that's right. But you don't know who's going to do it. And I, I find it that that's but on the other. Let me just interrupt. But on the other hand, it's Gregory Peck, so, so he might not die. So he they might, might not, not die. die. He might, right. yeah. might end with them right. kissing. Is the as it one year out. later he's walking back into town. And that's the beauty of the movie is that he does have to pay for his actions. Right. And that ultimately, you know, karma is going to catch you. Can't. That's what, like Hamlet. You know the. They're great portraits of the circular nature of violence. That as much as you, you can't just stop the wheel when you want to, because the wheel becomes more powerful than yeah. you. And he tried to make a name for himself, and now his own legend is killing him. Yeah, right. Doesn't all, all those, none of those things matter to him. The scene with this boy is great. Oh, it's it? beautiful. It's so touching. He wants yeah. him to go out there and tell those kids to behave better. He's trying to be a dad. You see a little bit of To Kill a Mockingbird. You're like, that guy can play a dad. Well, I asked for somebody to handle this situation. Why, Miss Harris told me you're the smartest kid in town. That's why I sent for you. Well, I'll try. Don't try. You do it. Westerns that end up having uncommon depths. Well, how about really how funny it is that the scene where the women come into the jail. Yeah, it's great. And, he, and that's the tone of the movie that is so surprising because on some levels, it's incredibly serious. The hero dies at the end. Right, yeah. And it's incredibly comic. I mean, that scene is... He dies he, at the end after just meeting his son, right? For the first time. For the first yeah. time. Yeah. And after perhaps recovering his relationship with his wife. No matter. Doesn't matter. When she says, tell him Mrs. Jimmy Ringo is here. Right, I don't know, I get, like, I even know. saying it now, right? You I know, little, I know. Yeah. The funeral at the end. Yeah, oh, they're, like, they're, they're like, there are no seats, and then they go, but tell Mrs. Jimmy Ringo's here, and then, there were two seats. There two were seats yeah. right in the front. <laughs> yeah, there were two seats That's right called the, the 50s yeah. for you. Yeah, you, that, now they would do that a little better. Right, they'd probably do, yeah. The, uh, yeah. Uh, and uh, we should mention Carl Malden. And he's, uh, he's great. Yeah, he's so great. But what's yeah. neat is that he's playing kind of the classic Carl Malden part before it was the classic. Totally, that's right. I mean, he just owns that part. Nobody could play a barkeep like Carl Malden. That's right, Malden. nobody. Ethan, great stuff. Thank you. We got one more film from Ethan Hawke coming up tonight from 1950. It's Gun Crazy. Stay with us. It's next on TCM. Next on TCM, Gun Crazy. Then tomorrow is another day. And later, the remains of the day. It's not too late for more TCM tonight. Welcome to TCM, Ben Mankiewicz, joined once again by writer, novelist, actor, director, uh, Ethan Hawke. Ethan, thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. You programmed uh, The Gunfighter to kick off this double mm -hmm. feature, and our next one, Gun Crazy. Turns out they're both from 1950. She didn't quite realize when you picked them, right? I didn't. Yeah. And what's significant about that year? Well, what's significant about the year to me is that it's the year my father was born. And I think that when I first heard about double features, it was from my dad telling me what a double feature was. And yeah. I used to go see a double feature. So I think when you called and asked me to pick one, 
I was like, double feature. And in my mind, I started thinking about my dad. Yeah. Y you know how you do. And I thought that it was important. Obviously, the titles went together, and I think that just makes, I don't know, you need, yeah, you need sure. a sexy something to sell. Sometimes that's feature. all a double feature had to be. Yeah. Right? yeah. Right. And But these two, strangely, the black and white photography is both excellent. They're both short. They, they're not, they're a little pulpy. Both yeah, of them, both, and sure. they're, they're both elevated pulp. And I think that Gun Crazy is a good follow-up because it's so much fun. It, 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 it gives you, you know, the second movie in a double feature needs to be the more fun one. You, you know, so one, because you're a little patient right, with the gun, first gun, one. Gunfighter, that's got a big movie star in it, right? That yeah, had Greg you got, Pat, you got Greg. Yeah. But this one doesn't have any actors that I had heard of. And I, when I went to see this movie, I have... I was a full-blown grown-up with a 14-year-old son, and I had been hearing rumors of this movie forever. I just thought it sounded like such a bad movie. I would see people have the poster. It's and just a silly title. It right? just sounds stupid, you know, gun crazy, and there's a you know, femme fatale chick with a <laughs> pistol or something. But there's a certain kind of magic, I think, when somebody elevates a B movie. Like, gun crazy was supposed to be a B movie, just a genre, bang, bang, shoot them up picture. And the people who made it obviously put a ton of thought and energy into it. And they just elevated the whole movie. Phil John Dahl, Peggy Cummings, they're both sharpshooters. They meet on the sharpshooting circuit in an insane scene where they wear a crown of candles and they each shoot at each other lighting the candles. I mean, it's just, it's insane. It's so insane, <laughs> yes, and you but, can't help it, but you're like, is this erotic? Right, I, I guess it is. I guess it is, but I mean... something wrong with this but literally, movie. missed by an inch. The, you They're dead. Them, dead. Yeah. Yeah, shot in the forehead. But Dahl and Cummings are, 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 are wonderful here. I They're know, wonderful. Yeah. And when I saw it, I had such a fantasy. I, I just wanted to remake this movie so badly because it's so fun. And it, it, it's rare, that strange combination when something is really smart and... Is, is moving you in ways you don't quite understand and really entertaining. Eddie Muller was sitting next to you. He'd now list off 15 noirs that yeah. that meet that standard. Gun Crazy, which is a definite noir, you know, meets that standard. There's nothing, literally nothing wrong with this movie. You There's know, no, it, and I think what's cool about our double feature is we have the Western and the noir, which were two huge genres of, that, of this period yeah. Yeah. that are a little... Um, History isn't sure what to do with these. Right, for totally different reasons, right? Yeah, for, some of the Westerns were, were some, uh, many B Westerns, but some of the Westerns were big budget movies. Almost none of the Noirs yeah. were, but but there has been so many impactful films. It's kind of like crime films. fiction, you know, just. That's right. But every now and then somebody would do it really, really well. And this is an example. So you, I'm curious, you mentioned, is that the kind of thing you'd still like to do? Would you like to, and do you see yourself, if you if you were to, a remake because again you know you want to it's tough to figure out which movies to remake right you don't want to remake great movies but here's a great movie that very few people saw so that would be the reason to yeah, do it yeah in general i always think you should remake movies that failed like right. the, oh, that's a great idea yeah, it didn't but, work right. the hard thing i did a remake of the magnificent seven and one of the things that's so hard about trying to remake a movie that means a lot to other people they're just never going to think your no, version no, is better than the one they grew up on they're never going to think that's that. right and you'd be way better off picking you know some totally forgotten western that didn't really work but had a great idea to it that's you, right you know? yeah, yeah but i think this is I, I think this meets a standard because it's so certainly by modern audiences uh underseen do you see now you see yourself starring in it or directing well it? i'm too old now you now can, i'd have now, to direct it yeah direct it's it, kind of, play a sheriff maybe yeah exactly. that's right yeah yeah <laughs> no but i remember when i first saw it i i i thought greta gerwig should play the oh you that's know good. i thought yeah. she would have been great is yeah that? all right ethan Let's watch the movie. We'll talk afterwards. Here it is from 1950, directed by Joseph H. Lewis, John Dahl, Peggy Cummins, Gun Crazy. Back with Ethan Hawke, actor, director, screenwriter, novelist. Uh, thanks for being here, Ethan. <laughs> thanks for having me. Programming this uh, wonderful uh, double feature tonight, The Gunfighter from 1950 with Gregory Peck was our first movie. Also from 1950, we just saw Gun Crazy with uh, John Dahl and Peggy Cummins. Um, I mean, a somewhat, uh, you know, beautiful, poetic uh, ending to this. Again, it's uh, it makes the, you know, I mean, his true character still comes out, right? He's in this to shoot cans and win prizes, right? He does not want to hurt anybody. And, he, and, and this woman, he loves to death, right? He yeah. shoots her and knows that'll probably bring about his death as well.
But the way it's shot is so elegant, so succinct. They don't waste any time. And the shot is always communicating so much information. And it's beautiful to look at. Yeah, so much movement too, right? I mean, there's a lot of run downstairs, run past the camera, running down a hallway. There's something almost French New Wave about this film to me, the way it feels. Oh, I, I think that's totally right. We are seeing a black and white film that has tremendous energy. Yeah. And that's what the New Wave felt like to me. And I don't know, there's something about feeling that kind of artistic energy inside a noir. That long scene, really shot from the back seat of a car. It's the bank heist scene. We don't even go inside the bank. How did they have the idea for that? Like, I can't even imagine, think, I know how we're gonna show the bank heist from the back seat of the car, the whole heist. And then you, I mean, I just can't even imagine thinking that and then talking everybody else, they would go like, that's not the way to, sh you, you can't show a bank heist and never leave the back and seat it, of the car. And it, and it lets them do a big set piece that would normally be pretty expensive and have a lot of- Extremely extras, time consuming. Right, time consuming. And they didn't, and, and, and it still has all that drama. But I wouldn't have believed it would have me feeling. on the edge of my that's seat. Right. They did it, right? That's, yeah. that's Russell, in fact, Russell Harlan and, and, and Joseph Lewis there. It's incredible, yeah. and it, there's a lesson in that, and a lot of great directors, is, you know, Shakespeare himself does this, is that the power of violence happening off screen or off stage, um, it, it, I don't know why exactly, but our imagination yeah. fills in everything. The two main characters are so screwed up, and yet the movie itself is so romantic. After that heist, they're supposed to go their separate ways, but they look back at each other, they can't to some extent, lets her off the hook in our eyes. Like we can still go back to rooting for them to get away, even though, you know, they're criminals, right? Yeah. They're dangerous, dangerous criminals. And that's what criminals. I kind of like about them. By the end of the movie, you really realize like, oh, right, you guys are, you're the bad guys. You're the bad guys, right. Yeah. 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 Your, yeah. your friends are the good guys, yeah. Yeah. Ethan, it's been great. Thanks for having me. Always. Thanks for showing these movies. I love these movies. I hope uh, people enjoyed them. I think they're fun uh, and I hope, I hope other people do too. Uh, no question. Uh, great double feature. Well done, my friend. Uh, Ethan Hawke, everybody. Ethan's done for the night, but of course the movies continue on TCM and as always, they are uncut and commercial free. Next on TCM, tomorrow is another day, then the remains of the day, and later cries and whispers. TCM hits the Swede spot tonight.